We're going to do this real quick. I want you to grab your Bibles, uh, or if you're like most of you, wait for it to come on the screen. <laughs> um, we're preaching this series, and we're closing it out today, called 24-6, uh, The Rhythm of Rest. And what we've been looking at the last four weeks is all of the ways in which through scripture and biblical foundation, through theology, through sociology, even through psychology, that we have found unequivocally that God's design for our lives is not to live 24-7, but rather it's to live 24-6. That God has called us to live Sabbath-shaped lives. And in week one, we kind of dealt with this idea of the reasons people resist rest. In week two, we started talking about healthy rhythms of life and actionable items that we can apply to our daily living. Uh, in week three, we kind of dealt with what like, it takes to do that. Like, what does it take to sustain? How many people know starting something is easy, sustaining it is hard? And so in week three, we talked about what does it take to be sustainable in lifestyles and rhythms that honor the design of God for our lives. In week four, last week, we kind of go, got a little excited and we talked about the fact that we didn't want to make the mistake of not entering the rest of God because we didn't recognize it. Here's why. Because most people think rest is the absence of struggle, but rest is not the absence of struggle. It's knowing who you're struggling with. And it's knowing that as long as God is with me, I can go to sleep tonight because I'm not alone in this battle. And so as we begin to think through this series, uh, we're going to bring it to a close today. Uh, and I'm excited because I begin to think to myself, if we're going to bring this to a close, if we're going to live these principles out, what is the last thing that could rob our rest? What could get in the way of us experiencing the fulfillment of God's design for our lives? And I believe it's found in Matthew, starting point to our conversation today. 537. I'm going to give you several scriptures today, but we're going to start here, Matthew 537. Now, look, I know some of y'all uh, uh, don't understand the Bible. The Bible is real difficult to understand. Uh, I went to seminary, got a master's in divinity, uh, and I, I studied for three years uh, to do that, uh, to, to, to unpack this scripture for you. It's really deep. I know it's going to be tough for some of you uh, because today, many of you may know we're talking about the power of a no. Somebody say the power of a no. We're, we're talking about the power of of a no. I'm, I'm preaching to us today. I'm not preaching to y'all. How many people like me struggle to say no? Let me just see your hands really quick. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Y'all like me. I'm preaching to me today. I'm preaching to me today. And, and I know this scripture is going to be really deep and it's going to be really tough to unpack, but here it is, uh, a scripture. It says, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Uh, okay. Now look, um, let me unpack this for you. I know it's real deep. We come to church for the profound. So I know it's going to take a little minute. Sit again. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay. Stanley, I got a master's in divinity just for this moment right here because it's a deep moment right here. Because I know some people are like wrestling with understanding scripture. So this one is real tough to get. Let me, let me just say it one more time because I don't want you to miss it. This is what Jesus says. All you need <laughs> to say is simply yes. Or, that ain't even a contemporary version. You know, we'd be like message translation. This is like the Jesus version. Anything beyond this comes from evil one. That's it, Lord. I pray that you bless this word. Let them not hear my voice or see my face, but hear you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, I want to preach today from this thought, the power of a no. Power of a no. I don't know about many of y'all, but um, I struggle with the word no. In large part because, if I'm just being honest with you guys, I don't like letting people down. You know, I don't like hurting people's feelings. Come on, can I get an amen right there, anybody? I, I, I struggle with no. I'm just preaching to us today. I'm not preaching to y'all. I struggle with no. And uh, here's the reality of the fact. Um, here's the reality. That, that, that no, I believe, uh, got a negative connotation far before I had control over it. If you really think about your childhood, let's take a trip down memory lane really quick. Uh, no, at its inception in our lives was a negative thing. I mean, just remember being a child, and there was no word that ruined your day. Like, no. I mean, if you want to be the ultimate fun killer, tell people no. Okay, okay, like, like, Ma, can I have some candy? No. Can I go outside with my friends? No. I used to ask my daddy this all the time. Dad, can I have some gas money to go hang out? No. You don't pay no bills around here? <laughs> you know your daddy gets serious when he say around here. 
Don't pay no bills around here. You need to find your own gas money. Go around here, cut some grass in the neighborhood. There ain't nothing that could mess up your plans, your day, your weekend, like a note. Or, or remember like in middle school, we used to write the notes. <laughs> and used to fold them up. How many of y'all could fold? Where my folder is at? Where my folder is at? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It took you like the whole block to be able to unroll it. Like. And, and it was like, check, yes, no. Sometimes you got a maybe in there. But here's the thing, like, they were, why is it some of y'all did this? This is how childish y'all were. Y'all checked no and then refolded it with the same creases, gave it back to them, and they worked hard to unpack a no. And from the early parts of our life, the word no has always been attached to negativity. It has always been a disappointing word. It has always been a word that has been detrimental to our joy. But I believe today that what we see in Scripture uh, and what we will unpack in just a few moments is that God has never intended for a no to be a negative thing because here's what you need to understand today, that you cannot add value to your yes if you don't learn how to say no. A lot of us don't have valuable yeses because we say yes to everything. Our yes does not have as much meaning because our no's add value to our yes. Why? Because if everything is important, then nothing is. Did y'all hear me? Don't miss it. If everything is important, nothing is. Everything can't be important or nothing is. And here's the problem. God tells us no. I mean, prove it to you. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He's talking to the Father. He says, if there be any other way, let this cup pass me. And essentially, we can imply, because it doesn't tell us what God said, but we can make the safe assumption that if he went to the cross, if he died, if he rose again on the third day, that God's answer was no. There is not another way. Paul echoes this. Paul says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take this away from me, this thorn in my flesh. And his response to me was, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. I love Christianese because it's like churchy people find ways to say stuff real deep. Paul writes all of those sentences to simply say, Lord, look back at him and say it, no. My grace is sufficient for you. You you ever been writing a paper and you felt like you needed to like get like 200 more words? So you just start saying stuff. Come on, how many people just be saying, I don't know what else to say. I, I really don't have nothing else to say. So we just go, and colon. Like what I was saying in the last sentence. Like, <laughs> I, th- I feel like that's what Paul said. Paul was like, I asked the Lord three times. To, all he had to say was the Lord said no. He said, his grace is sufficient for me and his strength is made perfect in my weakness. But essentially God's answer was no. So no is a valuable tool when you know how to use it in your life. And the enemy's greatest strategy, tra- tra- strategy against many of us is to get us consumed with yeses so that we cannot fully live out the rhythm that God has designed for our life. There's this quote by uh, Greg McCowan. He writes the book, Essentialism, and I've given you several books throughout this series. This was one that I wanted you to be able to be empowered to go read on your own. So we talked about deep work. If you want to be more productive without compromising healthy rhythms, Deep Work by Cal Newport is a great book. We talked about the five gears, which gave us language for awareness for how we honor rhythms. But, but, but today I want to give you one last book in this series. It's Essentialism, uh, The Disciplined Pursuit for less. The discipline, pursuit for less. This is a long quote, but just stick with me right here. I want you to see what Greg McCowan says in the book Essentialism. He said, the word priority came into the English language in the 1400s. Catch this. It was singular. It meant the very first or prior thing. And it stayed singular for the next 500 years. Catch this. Only in the 1900s. Did we pluralize the term and start talking about priorities? Only once you give yourself permission to stop trying to do it all, to stop saying yes to everyone, can you make your highest contribution to the things that really matter. Okay. Ain't that good? Ain't God good? Watch this. 
Here's essentially what he said. You cannot give your all to everything and value the things that matter most. It is not possible. And can I tell you, I talked to a lot of people, and this is, I'm preaching to myself today. Tap your neighbor and say, he's preaching to himself. He's preaching to himself. Because you want to know the greatest reason why many of us don't please God? Watch this. We always talk about Satan and temptation and all of these distractions, and he comes like a roaring lion. Here it is. Here it is. You want to know the greatest temptation that troubles many of us? This is the enemy to many of us pleasing God. The greatest enemy to many of us pleasing God is pleasing people. I'm going to talk to you all over here. The greatest enemy to most of us fully honoring God in our lives ain't got nothing to do with the devil. The devil ain't showed up this week. He ain't talked to us. He ain't showed up in our house. We blaming him. The devil was busy. The devil ain't do nothing this week. The devil took off. He was on vacation. We make decisions to please people at the expense of pleasing God. God says, hey, I want you to do this. And you say, okay, but what about so-and-so? God says, I want you to take this next step of faith. And you say, I would, but who going to help my friend over here? Person you've been praying for, this marriage is going to be everything. But, Lord, you called me to help him get his life together. I'm called to him. Hey, Lord, you called me to help him get his life together. Okay, my fellow's over here. Lord says, hey, I'm calling you to higher heights. You're like, but that's my boy. We've been homies. And the greatest enemy to many of us pleasing God is the temptation of pleasing people. That we are so committed to people that when God calls us to move, that when God calls us to speak, when God calls us to do, we will compromise the honoring of God's design for our life so that people won't be mad at us. So that people won't be disappointed in us. I'm preaching to us, not y'all. And here it is. If you want to say no more often, I got four tools for you. You ready? Here it is. If you want to have the strength, the capacity, the courage to say no more often, here's number one. You're going to have to stop managing other people's insecurity. Because you say, no, I can't make it tonight because you need a day to just enjoy your own space. You need a day to be with God. And now they say things to you like, oh, my God, this is what all my friends do. First of all, you got to deal with your feelings about all your friends. But this one needs a night off. This one needs some rest. This one needs some sleep. And you got to make up in your mind, I'm not here to manage all your feelings about everybody and all your hurt. I am here to live a life that honors God. Not my responsibility to manage your insecurity. Oh, I can say no. Here's the second one. We're going to stop attaching frequency to fulfillment. We're not going to say because I did more stuff than the other person that it meant I was more fulfilled at the end of it. Some of us are trying to pad our calendar this summer. We're doing 30 events, and we hope the reward at the end is fulfillment, and all we're going to end up having or experiencing in our lives is frustration and more distance from the people we say we loved and we did it for, but we worked hard to fulfill the assignment, but we didn't fulfill the initial assignment. Catch this, who are, we were called to. So some of us have dishonored family so we could do more events. You've dishonored your kids so you can be seen more. You dishonored the friend who needed you most so that you could get a, another network. And God said, you cannot attach frequency to fulfillment because some of us have lived long enough to testify to the fact that we've had some seasons where we worked to the bare bone only to get to the end. And the reward wasn't what we thought it was going to be. It was more frustration, more fatigue, more fear. Frequency does not equal fulfillment. Here's the third one. Stop assuming. Oh, this is going to bless y'all life right here. I live this one real well. Stop assuming free time means availability. Hello. Watch this. Here's what happens. Here's what happens. We look at our calendar and we be like, I'm free. No, you're not. Because catch this. If you had a rough week, if you exhausted, here's, I'm going to tell y'all like this. 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 Sometimes people ask me, they'd be like, you know, like, hey, you free today? Are you free on Friday? I'd be like, nah, man, I got something on my schedule. You know what's on my schedule? Reading a book. <laughs> I had it on my schedule. It's priority. 
Would you, would you, oh, man, can you get together at 10? Nah, man, I got, I got an appointment at the gym so I can remain healthy. Like, you got to be okay not feeling. Here's what we do. We look at our calendar, and we try to fill every free spot. And then we get to the end of the journey and wonder, why am I so tired? Why am I so fatigued? I'm so burnt out. Because you took all of your free time and filled it with stuff. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to stop thinking all free time is availability. Number four, we're going to stop confusing visibility with accomplishment. Just because you were seen does not mean God was pleased. Some of us are so busy trying to get to platform and to get to public space that we're dishonoring. Could it be that the greatest accomplishment in this next season Uh, that God is trying to manifest in your life will not happen in the public eye. And you will be more well-rested when God is ready for to give you the public eye. (laughs) And you'll be ready to sustain because you honor this season well. So stop assuming or confusing visibility with with, with, with accomplishment. God wants you to be healthy, and it requires a no. Somebody say, say no. It requires that you have the confidence and the capacity to say, I cannot do it all. Jesus brings this to full picture for us, and he's going to help us bring this series to a close. I want to share with you these three final thoughts as we bring this series to a close. It's found in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Here it is, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. Message translation. Are you tired? I love the Bible. Some of y'all are like, yes. I am. Are you worn out? Yes. I think I am. (laughs) Some of y'all going to be scared to say this from church. Are you burned out on religion? Yes. I think I am. Come on here. Some of y'all think I'd just be excited every Sunday to come here. Sometimes I'd be like, can we just take a, like, is it like a PTO for church? Like, can we just? (laughs) Y'all going to act like y'all don't think it too. Some days I'd be like, I got to be able to call out today. Can there anybody? This is. Like we get, people get burned out. Look at what Jesus says. Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch How I do it, walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. And look at what he says. He says, and if you can do this, I won't lay anything on you heavy or ill-fitting. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Three things I want to give you and I want to root them in Scripture and I'm going to be done. Here it is. I know today's service was a little bit longer than usual, but I think we honor God well. But I want you to hear me on these. Jesus helps us to understand. Walk with me, work with me, watch me. Here it is. First thing he says is, he says, walk with me. If we really look at Jesus' walk through the Bible, through his 33 years on this earth, particularly the ones where he was having his greatest impact, 30 to 33, it is impossible to walk with Jesus. I mean, if we just put ourselves in there with him, walking with him, and to not see the principle of presence active. In Luke alone, in the gospel of Luke, we see over 10 accounts where Jesus's miracles, impact, and teaching happens by way of a meal. In other words, Jesus is not waiting to get to the temple to have influence on people. Matter of fact, I would dare say most of Jesus's miracles, ministry, and the helping of people doesn't happen when they get to him, it's when he goes to them. It's in passing that he changes people's lives because he knew how to give people the gift of presence. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at Jesus and look at this. Jesus prioritizes presence as a means to influence. Jesus prioritizes presence as a means to to influence. Do you know what we have to do better? I mean, if we could just summarize all this stuff we talked about the last five weeks. Here it is. Stop texting and talking to people. Give them the gift of presence. 
Stop trying to say you care about them if you can't give them the minimal gift of your attention. Put your phone away and say more important than being connected to the world in this moment is being connected to you. I'm preaching to myself. Preaching to myself. If you get something from it, cool, but I'm preaching to myself. Presence is the greatest gift. And Jesus does his best ministry through the gift of presence. So we should do the same. We talked about through this series, many of us value accomplishments more than relationships. We say no more today. We will walk like Jesus walked. Here it is. He says, work with me. Mark 135 says this. Here's what I love about Jesus. You cannot look at the way Jesus worked and not see him have healthy rhythms. I'll prove it to you. Mark chapter 1 verse 35. Very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, went off to a solitary place where he prayed. What does Jesus show us? Jesus is like, I'm getting away from y'all. I need some time to myself. I need to be with the Father. I need to pray. I need to focus. I need to recharge. I need to refresh. Matthew 14, 23 says this. After he had dismissed them. Don't miss this. This is right after the 5,000 got fed. Many of us don't read this story in its entirety. Don't read it in fragment. Remember the reason Jesus went to the place where the 5,000 were fed. He did not go there to feed 5,000. He went there because he told the disciples, let's get away to some place where we can rest. So Jesus takes this journey, but people found out. They all show up. He had compassion on them. He feeds them, but he still is prioritizing rest. And so look at what he does. I love how it changes. Stanley, he went from inviting his disciples to be like, now I don't even need them. I'm so tired now. I don't want nobody. <laughs> he invited his disciples. 5,000 people show up. He feeds the 5,000. And after he had dismissed them, he dismissed his disciples, said, go across the lake. He went up on the mountaintop by himself to pray. And later that night, he was still there. Alone. Here's what's interesting about this passage. Here's what's interesting. Here's what's interesting. This is right before Jesus is about to walk on water to the disciples on the boat. And many of us spend all of our time trying to figure out the secret to the power of Jesus. Like, I just, you know, Jesus told me great, even greater works we will do. And so I want to walk in power, but we don't want to live like Jesus lived. Here's the problem. Jesus lived a simpler life. Some of you are trying to ex- get the power of Jesus by doing more. Jesus was like, I'm going to go over here and pray by myself. Prove it to you again. Disciples tried to cast out a demon. They tried all day. Junior, after all their efforts were in vain, Jesus shows up after being in what? Prayer. Cast it out in a second. And they're like, how does he do it? And could it be that he's trying to help us to understand all along this principle? Jesus prioritizes solitude and silence before serving others. Doesn't say we shouldn't serve others. But that our priority should be being in the presence of God, recharging, having perspective, being refreshed, and from a place of rest, we can serve the kingdom better. We can serve our family better. We can serve our friends better. Jesus works in rhythm. Here's the last thing. He says, watch me. It's important to understand Jesus prioritizes rest over worry. It's in Scripture, Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, what you will wear. It's not life more than food and the body more than clothes. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Whatever shall we wear, for the pagans run after all these things. Heaven Father already knows what you need. Seek first his kingdom, and these things will be given to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Some of us cannot experience the rest of God because we're always consumed with worry. What's going to happen? Okay, how about, but what about this? What about this? We talked about last week. Most of us, our greatest enemy is our imagination. We lose in sleep over something that might happen. We lose in sleep over something that could, they could have said that. I I saw them meeting in the office today. Maybe they about to do... Stop, go to sleep. Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's going to bring its own stuff. And if something happens tomorrow, deal with it tomorrow. But when you work with Jesus and you walk with Jesus and you watch Jesus, he helps us to understand 
It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. The last things that Jesus does before he goes to the cross is has a meal and a time of prayer. Do the same tonight. Live like Jesus, freely and lightly. I want to go back to Matthew 11 really quick as we close. He says this, and this is the question I want to ask you today as you take all the content from these last five weeks and try to apply them to your life. Here it is. Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out? Come to me, all who are heavy laden. Get away with me, and you will recover your life. Today, if I want nothing else for you, I want to put this last word on the screen. Recover. 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 Would you bow your heads with me? For a few moments, I want you to just rest in the idea of what recovery looks like for you. Because here it is. Bring this sermon to a close with this. There is no future recovery without the power of a present no. There is no future recovery without the power of a present no. What are you about to say no to so that you can recover? What are you about to say no to? Who do you have to say no to? Stop managing insecurity. Stop trying to think frequency and fulfillment go hand in hand. Just what am I saying no to? Lord God, I don't know what rush and worry we bring to this conversation today, but what I do know is that you'll meet us in the middle of it. Lord God, we need to know today that as we pursue the rhythm of rest, that as we remember week two sermon, John uh, 15, where you say to us, he who abideth in me beareth much fruit. She who abideth in me beareth much fruit. God, we want the fruitfulness. We, we, we want to be successful. We want to be productive. We want to honor you. We want to do all those great things that we have in our hearts and in our vision. We just don't want to do it at the expense of our families. We don't want to do it at the expense of a relationship with you. We want to honor you. We want to abide in you in all things. So God, help us. Help us to abide. And to remember that God's design for our lives is not 24-7, but 24-6. Now there may be somebody in this room today who needs to accept you as their Lord and Savior, Lord Jesus. We don't want to ever leave a service without offering opportunity. Maybe they're saying today, I know that I feel something in this room. I don't know all the songs that we're saying. I don't know all the scriptures that were read, but here's what I know without a shadow of a doubt, that I feel the Spirit of God pulling on my heart, and I want a relationship with Jesus. I want to leave here different than the way I came. If that's you today, nobody's looking at you, nobody's judging you, just lift that hand in the air. Uh, nobody's going to ask you to say anything. Nobody's going to ask you to do anything. Uh, maybe you're somebody in this room today saying, I want to rededicate my life to Christ. I want to give God another chance. I want to rededicate my life to Christ. I've been in a relationship with God, but I've misprioritized God's presence in my life, and I want to get back to where God belongs. If that's you today, just lift that hand. No, we're not going to ask you to say anything. We just want to pray for you today. Amen. I see you, I see you, I see you. God sees you and the angels are rejoicing in heaven. There's seven hands in the air. As a matter of fact, eight hands in the air. We're going to pray all together today that those lives are forever changed. So everybody in the room repeating after me, we say, Lord Jesus, I give you my heart. I give you my mind. I give you my spirit. From this day forward, I am saved. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand.